Um, I'd just like to welcome you all to Smart at Cambridge Council's first ever public event. Um, some of you would have seen the presenter on people's events. This is the first one we put on ourselves. Um, we're really excited to have such a group turn out. Um, I can spot a few councillors amongst you, and I hope we've got uh, many more, and I hope you will report back to your councillors about what's going on tonight, um, both the parish councillors, city councillors, district councillors, and county councillors. Um, because at the end of the day, they're the ones who make decisions about what goes on. And so it's really important that they understand <coughs> what the options are, what your feelings are, and um, the, um, the things that, that hopefully you would like being here tonight. So I'd like to welcome, first of all, um, Colin Harris, who set up Cambridge Connect. Um, about the same time, or shortly after, we set up Smart Cambridge Transport. And he's developed um, a really impressive um, proposal for a light rail network. So I'm going to hand you over to, to Colin. Thank you very much. I'm not used to using the microphone, so bear with me if it's uh, a little bit touch and go with the microphone. Um, I wanted to start this evening um, really by congratulating Edward Lee for the initiative of Smarter Cambridge Transport. Um, he's uh, really, I think, uh, done a service to the community by raising... Um, sorry, is it not quite loud enough? Speak right Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just an amazing service to the community on a voluntary basis to highlight issues and suggest alternatives uh, to the um, proposals that are put forward. And, and this is really important for Cambridge, so I, I congratulate uh, Edward on his initiative. Um, and the topic tonight is rebooting the city here, and I couldn't help but think that um, we should have been having this meeting three years ago and it should have been called Booting the City Deal. Um, I think uh, it would have been perhaps useful if at the start we'd had community meetings like this to, to explore different ideas and to uh, really um, exchange um, information about what kinds of solutions are appropriate for Cambridge. Um, I'd also like to uh, commend Heidi Allen, the MP for uh, South Cams, uh, for taking a stand yesterday, um, suggesting not so much rebooting the city deal, but pressing the pause button. Um, she suggested that because uh, there's various things um, coming in the mix with devolution, etc., um, we really should stop and take stock and uh, really uh, explore long-term solutions uh, which are enduring for Cambridge. So I commend her for that. Um, a little bit about me. First of all, I'm not a transport engineer, um, so I'll put my hand up to that. Um, and I started this initiative called Cambridge Connect uh, just over a year ago in response to the uh, City Deal Call for Evidence. The reason I started it was because I was concerned about some of the proposals that were being put forward. In particular, I was concerned that it seemed to be devoid of a long-term strategy. Um, and also there were many elements to the proposals which didn't appear to be joined up as an integrated strategy. I work as a, an environmental consultant. I run a small business. I, I operate my business from home. Um, and I work mainly internationally. So I, I'm not an expert on Cambridge transport, but I do have a background in... Uh, environmental planning and, and spatial data systems. Um, so I'm really coming to this as a concerned citizen and uh, I, I guess it's because I care so much about Cambridge that uh, I felt I couldn't just criticise, I felt I should uh, try to do something positive as an alternative uh, to consider. Because I'm not an expert in transport, the first thing I felt I needed to do was partner with people who are experts. So uh, very early on in the initiative, once I developed the initial concept, um, I uh, got in touch with people that were uh, 
are um, involved with Rail Future, uh, which is uh, has a long history of planning of the rail system in, in the UK. And also, very recently, we've uh, formed a strategic partnership with a group called UK Tram. UK Tram is the industry body for light rail in the UK, and um, they have a great deal of expertise. One of our principal advisors uh, is um, Ian Brown. He was the uh, person that uh, established and saw through to completion the Docklands Slide Railway. Um, he was the managing director for TFL Rail um, at that time. And he has looked at our proposals in detail and he thinks that they are credible. So that's um, a little bit of background. Um, Cambridge Connect is an informal initiative. Um, we don't have a, a structure as such. It's, it's really interested people who uh, like the concepts and, and want to see uh, these sorts of ideas um, advanced in Cambridge. Um, okay, so the background. And um, I've got about 10 minutes, so um, I'll probably sort of gallop through things and we can ask questions later. Um, the first thing I want to do is set the whole problem in context. And uh, it's really about the scale and the pace of growth. It's, the pace of growth is in the order of doubling the population of Cambridge over a 15 year period. I'm not saying that all of those people, the 120,000 people that are coming into the Cambridge region are all going to be coming into Cambridge City. But the models predict that 120,000 new people will be coming into the Cambridgeshire region and the sort of near vicinity um, in the next 15 years. So this poses a, a major challenge, and I think it, it, it actually causes us to think about well, what kinds of solutions are appropriate for that scale of challenge. And uh, it was came with quite a shock, actually, when I first learned about that figure a year ago. Until then, I was blissfully unaware that this was coming down the line. Um, but actually, if you look at the data, I can be pretty confident this is going to happen and we really need to plan for it and we need to plan now. I thought I'd begin by just briefly recapping um, the city deal plans to sort of place things in context. Um, so as we all know, broadly speaking, it's a bus-based solution and that solution involves uh, bus lanes, busways, um, coming in on the radial routes into Cambridge, um, Piston Road, Milton Road, uh, A1307 in the south. And there's also these concepts called orbitals, um, which are in the mix. Broadly speaking, um, the solutions are, are all surface-based and they're all uh, centered around using buses in different, different ways. However, when I saw the original city deal plans, I was very concerned because the question I had was, well, what happens to these buses when they get to the city centre? <laughs> and in a city like Cambridge, which has a medieval street system and very limited parking space and, and space for any vehicles, how is that going to play out in the scenario where we've got that kind of uh, population growth uh, over the next 15 years? Um, so the city deal does have a solution to this, and um, that solution involves uh, closing the uh, main, main streets in the city centre at peak time. And um, the idea with that solution is that will uh, allow the buses to run freely, and therefore people will uh, transfer out of their cars onto buses and they'll be able to get to their destinations. So that's the solution on the table from the city deal. But I think we're all aware that uh, many people in the city are not really satisfied with that kind of approach. Um, I did some calculations for how many buses are we talking over a 15 year period. Um, so we've look, I've looked at the commuter data 
and then projected that ahead to 2031. At the moment, we have 125 buses coming into the city centre uh, at peak time every day. And that, that number is based on the timetable. I simply uh, went through all the timetables and counted up how many buses do we presently have. If we look at the numbers in 2031, 15 years' time, um, we can do a simple calculation and work out how many buses will be coming into this city centre and circulating. And the sort of number we get is between 200 and 300 buses per hour um, in the city centre. Now, you could you know, argue, well, some of the buses might go to Addenbrooke and some might go elsewhere, but broadly speaking, that's the, that's the big picture. So I had a question about, well, how, how is that going to work, particularly in a city like Cambridge, where we value the, uh, the heritage and the, the landscape within the city uh, very highly. And is it sustainable? Having looked at those sort of numbers, I thought, well, what's an alternative to this approach? Could, is there an alternative? Could we do this differently? And I looked at uh, light rail as a, as a possible uh, alternative solution. The reason I chose light rail is because, uh, looking at the data, it shows that light rail is actually twice as energy efficient as, uh, as buses. Um, so they can convey more people uh, for a lot less energy than uh, by bus. And for that reason, and probably because I'm an environmental consultant, I think that's good for the environment and it's something that we should be thinking about in the long term. The other reason I chose light rail is because it's, uh, it's, um, there's many, many examples of it. It's a proven technology. There's over 300 light rail systems throughout Europe. Um, so we, sh we should have confidence that that type of solution is, is appropriate, um, or could be. I looked at uh, one of the first questions that many people asked me is, well, yeah, but Cambridge is too small for a light rail system. So, you know, it's not going to work here. But actually, there's many examples of light rail in small towns or cities. Uh, Zahn is a good example. Uh, virtually the same size as Cambridge. I put a flyer out earlier in the evening, um, which you can look at the, the numbers. It's very, very similar to Cambridge. They have a metro system, they have light rail, and they have a ridership of 40 million uh, passenger journeys on that system per year. Um, and one of the reasons they have such a high ridership is 40% of the travelling public use the light rail system as, as uh, a means of getting about the city. In Cambridge, we have 8% using buses, so uh, the use of public transport is very different. So there's a number of benefits uh, to light rail, and um, I won't elaborate on those in view of the time that I've got tonight but you can look at uh, more information about those benefits on our website. Um, probably the, the most important ones just to highlight here is the reliability, and it's, it's fast, and it's, uh, high, it has high capacity and it's very scalable for the future. So what are we actually proposing? And um, what we're suggesting is that a light rail network could be developed in Cambridge. Um, and earlier in the year, we put out some ideas about what sort of form that could take. And based on feedback from the public, um, and also experts sort of talking to people at Rail Future, we've refined that model a little bit further, and we've prioritised um, a line that we call the Isaac Newton line, uh, referencing the, uh, the, the heritage of Cambridge. It would start at the Gurdon Interchange, um, and I'll, I'll come back to that shortly, but it would run overland through the West Campus, uh, round about the Cavendish, it would go underground, and we're advocating a tunnel. We think that tunnels are the only practical solution in the inner city. They are a lot more expensive, but uh, if you want to uh, solve the problem, you might need to make an investment. 
The tunnel would be 3.2 kilometres in length and it would go to the, uh, to the central rail station with stops at uh, areas like um, the University Library, the City Centre and Parker's Peace. From the central rail station, which is the key connection to the heavy rail network, it would extend southward down to Addenbrooks and out to the uh, M11. Um, and using, on this route, we would suggest that the existing busway could be easily converted to a light rail. We wouldn't have to do that, but it would make for an integrated system if you had a light rail all the way. And then from Ambrooks, it would extend through Sawston and then out to the area of Branter Park. And the reason we've extended it out in that direction, which is admittedly relatively low population area of, of the region, there's a lot of business activity out here and there's a lot of potential for growth and development. And let's face it, we, we do need to plan for growth. This is going to happen, so we need to be thinking about that. Um, of course, that line wouldn't address all needs in Cambridge, so we've suggested some extensions. Um, I think I skipped a couple of slides too quickly there. So, extension A was um, out to the northeast side of Cambridge, uh, Newmarket Road area, um, Science Park. The um, other extension could go to Fulbourne, and then an extension. Uh, following the A14, and that would essentially um, make it a circle line, um, which would uh, join back up at the Girton Interchange. The reason the Girton Interchange is selected as a, as a key point is because it's a, a critical junction on the strategic road network, east-west and north-south, and also we're thinking about the Oxford to Cambridge uh, Expressway, which is uh, currently being planned as part of national infrastructure development. Um, longer term, or, you know, depends on finance and how that all plays out, but um, there's potential for extensions um, out to Canborn, following the A428, possibly integrating in with East-West Rail, and there's also potential to extend out towards Haverhill, a key population centre in the South East. Now, why have we suggested those particular extensions rather than any others? If you look at the the existing rail network, it already serves the northwest and up to Newmarket uh, and also in the southwest um, region quite well. Yes, you could have more stations, but it, uh, let's make use of that existing rail network. Time is of the essence, <laughs> and I'm running out of it, but um, roughly nine minutes from the Gurdon Interchange into the city centre. Three minutes from the station to the city centre. Fifteen minutes from the periphery into the centre if you need to follow, use this light rail network. Another important factor is, well, how accessible are the stations to um, people where they live and where they work? So I, I did a simple calculation of the distance from any given station on the network to uh, within the residential and uh, employment centres of Cambridge. And what the figures show is that one third of the city would be within a four minute walk of a station or a two and a half minute cycle ride. Uh, two or almost three quarters of the city would be within a, um, about an eight minute walk. And 91% uh, of the city would be within a 20 minute walk or about an eight minute cycle ride. Now, if you think about that, it's transformative, or potentially transformative in terms of how people move about the city. And I, I'm coining that the green print for a sustainable city. Um, another thing that we all have to uh, live and cope with in Cambridge is tourism. Five million tourists visit Cambridge per year, and many of those come by coach. We think that there's potential to put a coach station out on the M11 and use the uh, light rail line to convey the tourists into the centre. It would be 15 minutes from there to the centre and we think that would be beneficial 
uh, from, for all reasons. So the big question, well, how much is all this going to cost? And the numbers are huge. Um, but I think affordable. Um, we've done some preliminary calculations, uh, not detailed cost-benefit analysis at this stage, and we're calling for that. Um, but based on other projects and um, sort of rough uh, figures for how much it costs to do light rail per kilometre, we get a figure um, of about um, 626 million uh, for the Newton line, which is the one that runs from the Girton Interchange to Granta Park. Um, so that's a little bit more than the city deal funding that's on the table. If you were to do the extensions, that is another 600 million, so you're looking at 1.2 billion. Um, and then if you were to extend further out to Camborne and Haverhill, you're looking at a figure sort of approaching probably 1.9 billion. Now these figures are large, and I, I fully acknowledge that, and certainly not possible within the city deal. However, um, we should think about what sort of investment is necessary, um, and, and also what's done elsewhere. So the Nottingham net, for example, was 850 million, um, and that has been transformative for the city. Um, we're currently spending about 1.7 billion on uh, upgrading the A14. So I would ask, is spending 1.7 billion justified in the mix of the whole of Cambridge and how we could transform it for the future? I believe it is. Um, and how would we pay for it? So I'm not going to go into these numbers about journeys because of the amount of time. Um, but just to highlight um, the headline figure, and this is extremely conservative, but the annual revenue that we calculate on the basis of a £1.20 per uh, journey fare is about £17 million per year annual income. That's not a great deal, but when you think that that figure excludes all tourists, we have not taken that into account, it also excludes non-commuter journeys. And the Cambridge Access study has shown us that actually 75% of journeys made in Cambridge are not for commuting. So this figure of 17 million is purely commuting. So in reality, that number would probably more double in terms of annual income. And then, then in terms of affordability, everything changes. So the question was asked at the start, is Cambridge Light Rail an alternative for Cambridge Transport. For Cambridge Transport. I say yes to this. Uh, we, we have um, been talking to experts in finance and they inform us that there are ways in which this could be financed over a 30 year to 60 year period. So it is, it is achievable. Um, and I think that's the responsible approach for Cambridge because it is so special. And uh, just a final thought. Um, why are we doing this? <laughs> it is about us to some extent, but really it's about making an investment for future generations. Thank you.